Hello and welcome to the Eternal Quest. I'm Paul Meyer. Here in the West over the past several years, people have grown more and more interested in holistic methods of achieving physical, psychological and spiritual well-being. Indeed, past Eternal Quest programs have focused on everything from shamanic practices to the use of sound in achieving better health. Today we want to take a look at another of these alternative approaches, one which involves, strangely enough, the use of visual symbols and pictorial motifs known as mandalas. Our guest today is Judith Cornell, a respected California artist, holder of the PhD in Art and Philosophy. She's the author of the book Mandala. Mandalas are pictures which involve visual symbols and pictorial elements from the natural world. These integrated and symmetrical designs can be found in many spiritual traditions, but are most closely allied with Eastern practices such as Hinduism and Buddhism. These powerful and beautiful designs are made for the purpose of representing psychological and spiritual states of transcendence and wholeness. Indeed, the very act of making a mandala is supposed to be a sacred act, a way of tapping into the divine. This artistic process can also be used to tap into the psycho-spiritual roots of disease. Indeed, Dr. Carl Jung, the famous psychoanalyst, was one of the first 20th century doctors to explore how non-Western cultures used symbol to describe and oftentimes treat their diseases. For Judith Cornell, the making of a mandala is a way of bringing order out of chaos in a person's psyche. She holds workshops and seminars, teaching people to make their own mandalas, convinced that by drawing such designs, people can unlock creative energies which help them with the healing process. A beautifully illustrated book, Mandala was winner of the prestigious Ben Franklin Award for excellence in design and editorial content. Dr. Cornell is interviewed in this program by Ray Grassi, assistant editor of The Quest magazine. In recent years, your work in books and workshops has centered around mandalas. Maybe we should start by having you explain what a mandala is. Mm -hmm. Most people have never heard the word mandala, and it simply means sacred circle. It represents the universe, the earth, all of us, our soul, nature, and that luminous quality which shows and represents our unity and oneness. How did this tradition come about in the first place? Well, as I traced it historically, it's really rooted in sacred art and can be found in the traditions throughout the world. In Tibet, the monks do uh, sacred mandalas through all the museums throughout the United States presently uh, so that peace and unity is understood and experienced, spiritual blessings are brought. In the Hindu tradition, the mandala has been used as a method of meditation to represent illumined states of consciousness. Now the whole Americans have used it to, uh, for healing and have had patients sit in sand mandalas in rituals around sacred chant. You use the word sacred art and uh, that seems to imply a distinction between some other kind of art or between Western art? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, I was trained as a Western artist. In the traditional sense, in that way, we were trained to be competitive, uh, to be exclusive, and uh, the premise was that art was only for a few. And it was based on strengthening the sense of ego, self. Sacred art is a surrender to the divine. It's representing divine elements of the soul and states of consciousness. Therefore, ego is not involved, but represents the higher self. So it's bringing a sense back to our relationship to God, or what we call the absolute consciousness. So it takes a whole different um, method and mode of creating sacred art. It's done in a prayerful state, and it's in inclusive rather than exclusive. How did you get into this in the first place? Uh, having been trained traditionally, uh, my work really represented uh, what I considered the fragmentation of our society. What I viewed from external uh, situations, light and dark, angst, 
male and female, all kinds of dualities. And then I had a mystical experience and a near-death experience, similar to like Betty Eady, although I didn't die in that sense, where I experienced the whole universe as light and cosmic consciousness, and saw and had an inner revelation of the purpose of art that was very different than the way I trained. And what I began doing was painting circles of radiant energy, of which I have a number of examples. One of the things I tried to represent was wholeness and healing. And this first slide represents, for me, the atom. And I got inside information on that by opening to meditation and prayer, where I understood that the energy that makes up our whole body was constructed of atoms and was actually spiritualized energy, that there was no separation of spirit from matter. And in the next one, it really represented what I considered at that time the spiritual eye. Blue and color represented a, an energy of going back in time and space into our sacred en energy and essence. And the last one I call E equals MC squared, and it looks like squared light. And it really was uh, an intuitive spiritual understanding of what Einstein was trying to convey when he said that all matter was energy. And the physicists have since discovered that that's true. And so I was representing a real essence of not only material reality but also spiritual reality. Hmm. And later come to find out these were called mandalas. What are mandalas made of or can they be made from different materials? Mandalas can be made with all different kinds of materials. They've been made with gold, precious gems, sand, flowers. I have people very uniquely work with mandalas on black paper with white and colored pencils, mainly to get in touch with the dark, unmanifested side of our soul consciousness and to begin, begin to see radiance or light through the white pencil to understand these concepts of our union with the soul and divine radiance. So I keep the materials very simple so that anybody, regardless of training, can use these materials to create beautiful luminous mandalas. And it's very magical when you work with that dark, unmanifested state, what I call the womb of the universe in its unmanifested state, bringing in your own unique pattern of light and consciousness. And that's what it helps to reveal very quickly for people. So it's a very magical and easy process. And people don't have to have any skills to do it. They don't have to have an artistic background. Absolutely not. In fact, it can be a hindrance. Because most people are trained from an art background to have ego involved. And this takes complete surrender to the process of having revelation kind of flow through you. From reading your books and hearing you speak in lectures, it seems to me that there are different levels that mandalas can work for people on, and one of them is the psychological level. Explain how it is that someone doing a mandala can affect them or heal them in some way. Yes, I think I have good illustrations of that, of, of a woman who took my workshop and then did 150 mandalas. One each day over a period of 150 days sat in meditation 15 minutes before she went off to work to teach children in a middle school and asked for intention to have a symbol revealed. And as you can see by the slides, she did these incredible jewel patterns of energy representing certain states of consciousness and symbols that revealed to her some inner knowledge. She would ask for an intention each day and wrote it on the back. And so I had her mounted as a spiral, which represents the unfolding of her own consciousness and healing. And since that time, she's gained incredible self-confidence and is continuing to do a PhD thesis and working with children to help empower them through use of the mandala. How is it that actually doing the mandala works on a person? Uh, what is it about the, the circle that, uh, that affects people psychologically like that? Well, one slide I'd like to show shows light, how it is incoherent and very fragmented. And if we think of our thoughts as being mostly like that, 
chaos most of the time. And I think the audience probably viewing this have moments of wondering how they're going to get through the next day, feeling states of depression and their energies being pulled in all different directions. The mandala, the sacred circle, you start with a circle, going into meditation, helps to bring these energies into focus, into coherency and wholeness and unity. And it works through several methods. One is a yoga, science of meditation, where they focus in the spiritual eye, here in the forehead, and ask in humility for a symbol to be revealed. So it's a matter of waiting, opening the heart to unconditional love, when the symbol arises, I have them see it as radiant and filled with light. And then they put it in their heart and use a sacred sound like Om. That activates that symbol as a mandalic pattern within the whole body-mind so it resonates and begins to change their consciousness from fragmentation to coherency, unity, states of peace and bliss can be felt as a result of this practice. The last part of it is drawing it. The first part is experiencing it in the body-mind. So it seems that it's not only a psychological, but it can move on to a spiritual level as well. Yes, in its highest state, the yogis who originally used sacred art of the mandala as a meditation practice represented their sacred scriptures through it, the Tibetans, for instance, or illumined states of consciousness called enlightenment. So it was a way for them to hold on to uh, going back to that core center, which is the spiritual eye, to begin to recognize and remember who they really were and are. So the mandala can either be a way of representing those spiritual states or of invoking those of spiritual invoking, states. invoking, right. So I have retreats where people actually in silence invoke those states hmm. of remembering who they are. Now let's take it one other level here. I've, I've understood that some people have physical healings as a result of working with mandalas. How is that possible and can you give some examples of that? Well. I also use mandalas in healing, uh, taking part of my own healing for cancer. I had breast cancer and was diagnosed and uh, decided that I would use this process to do mandalas to focus the healing energies in a very pointed and spiritual way before I went to the hospital. And then when I went to the hospital to have surgery, because I didn't feel my mind power was quite strong enough to dissolve the tumor, I would work in conjunction with modern medicine and surgery. And hung the mandalas in the uh, my room and people brought in flowers and I listened to meditation music and it was a very experienced bliss state where I took full control and power over my own healing in conjunction with others helping me to access that healing energy. I understand that people that have come to your workshops have also had some very powerful experiences like this. What, what are some of the more dramatic examples? Yes, uh, one dramatic one was a woman came to me with thyroid cancer she was diagnosed and was due for surgery 10 days before and decided she also felt that art could be a healing force and had no idea I was teaching the mandala as a healing force. And so I had her do three mandalas in that 10 days. We worked together. I had her visualize life energy coming and pouring through her hands and through her whole body to prepare and strengthen her body. Maybe uh, you've heard of chi energy or prana life force. So I had her do that and then ask for a healing symbol. And she did three different ones and progressively concentrated that energy. Took those mandalas to the hospital. Her mo mother even did a mandala for her and hung it in the hospital and brought flowers and they had the I told her about my own experience. Three weeks later she wrote me back that only a few cells did they find and no more surgery was needed. Yeah. So she put her own cancer in remission through the process of the mandala and focusing and uh, it was quite extraordinary. How do you think that actually worked in terms of what is it about doing the mandala? Was it a, a, uh, a purging process or was it tapping into a higher healing energy? Or? One always taps into the higher healing energy and because she focused like a laser beam now, if you've never gone through life-threatening disease, I have, she did, you become almost catatonic with fear. 
you feel like giving up, crawling in a hole and thinking, what's going to happen to me? Instead, you can redirect those energies, which I showed in that earlier slide, which looks very chaotic, and focus it like a laser beam so it really sends a tremendous amount of energy through the body-mind, and you're invoking the spiritual power of healing. And if it's meant to be, then the body also will instantly go through healing if you direct it with enough focus. But even if you don't, say that you have to let go of the body, you're still getting in contact with spirit and who you really are. So there is a transformation and a power that still helps in healing both body, mind, and spirit. Could you give some historical examples, perhaps, of how other cultures in the past have used the mandala as a healing tool? Yes, in Native American, the Navajo Americans have used the sand mandala, where a chanter constructs for a patient a special mandala, depending on the disease that they've been diagnosed with, and using their own mythological symbols constructs on the floor of the desert where they live a specific mandala out of sand and pollen and corn meal, a mandala which then the patient is invited to sit in. And the chanters chant over and they invoke the deities. And the patient fasts a number of days before, eats certain food. And then at the day of healing, the whole community joins in and participates in this healing as the patient is sitting there while the chanters are saying their special words and songs. And then at the end, the mandala is swept up and each person can take a few of the grains that were from that, but then the disease is let go through that whole process. Sometimes I actually have people that are going through healing uh, like the Navajo sweep up the sand afterwards. I've actually done burning rituals with people where they let go of something they want, they feel is making them ill, either psychologically or physically. I have them make a little mandala, put all their love and heart and soul into it, and then we burn it up. And it sort of releases that energy and also that pattern as a form of ritual, and that's been very powerful too. So there are a number of ways it can be done without being so culturally specific. The process I incorporate is really could be used in any culture worldwide because the key elements are light, sound, and consciousness, our own consciousness opening to the higher self, and sacred chants from all traditions could be used. Some of the more interesting work you've been doing in recent years has to do with the connection between sound and science, in particular this field of um, research called cymatics. Could you maybe say a few words about what that is? Well, going back to the biblical uh, words that in the beginning was the word. And that word, according to the great traditions, means vibration. That the whole universe, our bodily cells, our souls, were all created out of sacred sound. In the Hindu tradition, it's called Om. Amen from the Christian tradition. It is a vibration that was inaudible that then vibrated matter into light and patterns of what I call mandalic patterns. If you look at spiraling galaxies, for instance, you begin to see how sound forms them. In recent years, a scientist named uh, Hans Jenny did experiments to show how sound actually on foldable fluids creates mandalic patterns. What you see here is some of that research that he did on flowable fluids that actually demonstrates how sound frequencies and change of sound frequencies changes matter and creates various patterns. And what does this say to us? 
in our own lives in terms of what you've been talking about all along here so far? Well, that words and thoughts have incredible power because if we think of thoughts as sound vibration, words, if we're in a negative state, we're creating incoherent patterns which also can create disease and a sense of disassociation from others and a disassociation from the soul. So words have power to create patterns, to create healthy patterns or diseased patterns. So the mandala helps to keep a more positive state of who we really are and to bring us back into that unity. So I feel that research is very key to showing us that. So if I understand what you're getting to here, it's not just that words have power, but images have power. And that somehow by working with these images, a person can do what exactly? Well, the images give uh, intuitive insights. The mandala process, if it is truly revelatory, used in a meditative process, the images, which are sound and light patterns, gives to us, it mirrors back to us something that words itself couldn't. It gives us information and insights into the nature of our reality or into the nature of the problem. Uh, um, it makes the invisible visible. It's a symbolic language. It's like, to give you an example, they have uh, the computer now. You can take a math equation and put it in through the computer and see fractal images, which are patterns of light and sound. So the mathematicians are seeing new information being revealed through these patterns of light and sound now that they can make the equation into a picture. So words themselves have only a certain amount of information. So these patterns of light and sound can convey not only healing to us, but also our internal radiance that's invisible. Now how can people that are hearing this or watching this take these ideas and practically use these? What can they do today to work with these ideas? Well, I have a number of people working in all different fields, not only the fields of psychology and medicine, which we, people are doing it for life-threatening diseases and psychological integration, but I have also uh, have had letters from people who are using it in schools, teaching about geometry. So the mandala, when you get into geometry, actually uh, illuminating the geometry that they come up with math-wise. And a teacher wrote me from New Jersey that uh, she was teaching art and the math teachers now want to use it to teach geometry and has them illuminating the geometric shapes, which she finds are really very healing and very exciting and helping the students to get a whole new interesting understanding about geometry that it's not just lines, but it really relates to the inner and outer world. How can a person create their own mandalas? Well, it's a meditation practice, and that they do have to go through the process that is outlined in the book, that they sit and they get into a state of quietness. And I have done tapes so that people who don't know how to meditate, there's a guided meditation with music and step-by-step -step process in which they then focus in the third eye and ask for a healing symbol. In other words, they get very clear about what their intention is. It may be for healing. It may be for insight. Maybe they're having problems with a relationship. I've had people do it where couples have a relationship problem. And because we usually perceive each other from just the outer bodily, you know, male and female, if you go in as a, at a soul level and ask for a symbol to be revealed on how to heal that relationship, then you take that and make it and sometimes even give it to the person as a gift. So there's a lot of healing that can be done for relationships and for any other problems. Say you have old patterns, psychological patterns you want to let go. You're always angry. You're always feeling abused. You're always feeling like a victim. And as you go in, you ask for a symbol to help be released from that pattern. Because that's a thought pattern. I am a victim. If you think in terms I am a soul, and reveal to me, to help me remember that, to let go of this negative pattern, that can be very healing. I know that you also have some ideas about the more 
spiritual cosmic implications of the mandala. Could you maybe say a word about that? We need to go back to the very first thing that comes out of the Bible in the beginning was the word. And it was through that sound, that creative sound, the creative impulse that creates the ever-changing universe and created the galaxies, the planets, the atomic structure. If you look at each of those, they are patterns of mandalas that are ever changing, ever luminous. And then if you think about the human body being constructed of small mandalas, molecular structures being brought together, that all the chakras are mandalas, that the spiritual eye and the two physical eyes are mandalas, and that everything is constructed out of this light and sound, the implications are profound. If we understood this, we would be sitting in a sacred circle around the whole planet Earth, realizing that we are each children of this light and sound, and that the religions of the world were all saying the same thing when they said in the beginning was the word, and that love was the most incredible force for each of us to realize that in this diversity there is a unity and it comes out of that sound and light.